In this video, we'll break down UFC Vegas 69. We'll go over spots that we like, spots that we don't like, go over straight betting, and I'll give you access to some free money to bet with because I'm a nice guy. As always, you can call me Kunith. Let's make some money this week. Our last event was a good one outside of Robocop, who was dead to me. But Brandon Moreno unifies the championship. Jamal Hill gets that gold. Let's go. We had a lot of fun, but I don't want to waste another second of your time. We need to get into this breakdown. Hurry up, Oscar. Get over here right now. I'm tired of this. You pull up the graphics on screen when I tell you to or no dinner again. Right at the top of the card, we have our main event with Sergey Spivak and Derek Lewis, and this is a fight that obviously goes one of two ways. Either Derek Lewis wins by knockout, adding to his record for most knockouts in UFC history, or Sergey Spivak gets this fight to the mat and wins by submission or ground and pound TKO. Now there is a bet here for this fight that I think is sneaky that I'm going to be attacking this week, and I'll get into that right at the end of this. But for this fight, what I like for Sergey Spivak in this matchup is how efficient he is with his takedowns and how he's choosing to take his opponents down as well. Sergey Spivak isn't the type to shoot for double legs and chain wrestle. He rather leans on his judo, looking for trips and throws in the clinch, which is great for MMA in general, but especially in this weight class, it's something that I love to see. And I say that because that doesn't wear on your gas tank as much as changing levels and pushing guys up against the fence and lifting and cutting angles. It's more of a simple push, pull, trip, manipulating balance and letting your opponent's body weight do the work for you, which should serve him well against Derek Lewis, who is top heavy. Derek Lewis has some chicken legs compared to his top half. Like he weighs in right at the heavyweight limit at 265 and I think about 260 of that is above the belt. So that flamingo-esque build on Derek Lewis on the Black Beast is not going to help him this week and if Sergey Spivak can get this fight to the clinch he's going to have a ton of success. Now this will come as no surprise to any of you watching but obviously Derek Lewis has that great equalizer that sneaky hand speed and obviously some of the biggest power if not the biggest power we've ever seen. It only takes one from the Black Beast, and we've seen Sergey Spivak crumble under power shots before. Puncher's chance has never been more true than with Derek Lewis, and he's live for a KO here like he always is. And if you bet this fight on the Derek Lewis side, you just have to bet him by knockout. It's going to give you slightly better odds, and that makes a lot of sense. I don't know why anybody would take Derek Lewis' money line, because that would suggest that he wins any other way than knockout, unless you were just trying to get there early, but I don't think that the line is going to move toward Derek Lewis, at least not enough to make it worthwhile. Derek Lewis by knockout is the way to go if you're going to bet him. But Derek Lewis by knockout isn't my favorite bet here. My favorite bet for this fight is actually the over one and a half rounds. Hey yo, what the fuck? Which might sound crazy at first, but if you think about it, Derek Lewis is not a fast starter and he's not pressing the issue either. He's looking to aggressively counter, but he's not walking guys down most of the time and he's also very tough. Tough enough to fight off submission attempts, tough enough to take some of the ground and pound coming from Sergey Spivak and more than strong enough to work back up to his feet. Why use jujitsu where you could just stand up? Perhaps to attack it with a Kimura. The way, oh, look at this. He's giving up his position. Oh, no. High caliber grappler in his own right. And, and immediately, you see him? Black Beast, Derek Lewis, who literally just decides, I'm going to stand up now. He's going to look to it again. This is a different angle to attack the shoulder but here we go Derek Lewis wants to stand up what's he gonna do he's just gonna stand yeah. up and this is also a five round fight these guys might look to pace themselves here and plus they're gonna respect what the other person can do so there may be a bit of a feeling out process I don't see this fight going the distance I don't think there's any chance of that but the first seven and a half minutes is gonna rip off the clock quickly if you have the under and for Spivak in his last eight fights he's gone over one and a half rounds six times he does take his time he doesn't force anything and he's gotten a lot better over the years so I see see Sergey Spivak winning this fight striker versus grappler matchup I'm gonna go with the grappler inside the distance late second early third round give me Sergey Spivak inside the distance next we have a fight with Dalton Jung and Devin Clark Dalton Jung is looking to bounce back after being knocked out in the first round by Dustin Jacoby before that he was riding a long winning streak and that was made up of two things finishes and absolute bums before coming into the UFC he fought a lot of low-level guys and even when he got to the UFC he did beat some of the worst the promotion has to offer he beats Cadiz Ibragimov who went 0-4 in the promotion he beats slow Mike Rodriguez who was 
was two and six in his UFC fights, and William Knight, who he was able to trip take down eight times, and then an impressive win over Kennedy and Zedjaku. I will give him that. But even then, that elbow that stunned and Zedjaku looked like nothing, and a lot of us were confused. I remember people on Twitter, people in Discord being super confused about what they just saw. But then he comes across the guy who can match up with him physically and can strike, and he gets knocked out in the first round. So I think it's safe to say that the jury is still out on Jung as to whether or not he can make some real noise in the division. But luckily for him, he has a chance to do that this week. He's got a good matchup here against Devin Clark, who has coming up on six years in the promotion, almost seven years in the promotion, long run, but he's seven and seven in the UFC. And when he loses, it's either by way of finish or absolute one-way traffic. In his seven losses, he was finished six times. And the one fight that he wasn't finished that went the distance was against Iwan Kutelaba that you see right here. He got 10 aided in that fight. He got knocked out. He got taken down eight times, controlled for nearly 10 minutes. And where he's had success is against guys he can control with his physical strength in the clinch and where he could use his wrestling. But apart from that, he doesn't really offer much on the feet. He's very hittable. He doesn't respond well to being hit. And against a big, powerful, athletic guy like Jung, he's probably going to get lit up here. And this is a very clear situation where you have two guys on quite different trajectories in their career. You have Jung, who's a younger guy who's clearly reaching his prime and he's on his way up and Devin Clark is out of his prime on his way out. Fired. So the pick for me in this fight is Da Eun Jung, and it's going to be by knockout. Next, we have a matchup with two men that are built like raw chicken breasts. We have Marcin Tybor. He's fighting Blagoy Ivanov this week. And Blagoy Ivanov, man, talk about a guy who does not fight for your money. Now, as a disclaimer, I can tell you I have never lost money on Blagoy Ivanov's fights because I don't bet on him. <laughs> His ability to eat punches, avoid takedowns, slow the pace of the fights is tremendous. Tremendous. But he doesn't do enough as a result and he's constantly in close hard to judge boring decisions and you would think that a guy who trains out of aka has a ridiculous chin seemingly good enough cardio to remain steady for three rounds would have more success in the heavyweight division but no because he doesn't do anything on the other side of this matchup we have Marcin Tybora who's coming off the best win of his career he's going to be taller he's going to be much longer and he's going to bring a deeper bag of skills with him that he can reach into and this guy has seen a career resurgence over the last three years going six and one and his last seven with his only loss coming to Volkov no shame in that now he doesn't push a crazy pace either and he has a negative striking differential he's getting up there in age so I don't expect him to go out there and fight like J Alton Almeida he's not going to be balls to the wall all gas no breaks quite the opposite he's looking to take as little damage as possible at this point control where the fight takes place and win more minutes he does like to get his opponents down but Blagoy Ivanov is built like a Jansport backpack and it's very difficult to get him to the ground so expect a slow paced heavyweight contest where neither of these guys do a whole lot to pull away but Tybor is going to do just a little bit more to win rounds and if you want to bet this fight I would say picking Marcin Tybor makes sense putting money on the over would make sense or taking Tybor by decision makes a lot of sense as well next we have an interesting fight here with Duho Choi and Kyle Nelson this is tough for me and tougher than I assume it is for a lot of people because Duho Choi years ago was a hot name in MMA when he first came into the UFC stringing together three first round finishes in a row. Since then, he's lost three fights in a row, but he is a good striker who throws hard, straight, fast punches and could do so for the entire fight. If you need evidence of that, go back and watch one of the best fights of all time between him and Cub Swanson. But my issue with Duho Choi is the inactivity. It's very hard to trust because we just haven't seen him and we haven't seen him win. His last win was nearly seven years ago. To put that into perspective for you, Conor McGregor beat Eddie Alvarez more recently than Duho Choi has won a fight. And since then he hasn't really done anything in the octagon that would suggest that he's gotten any better if anything his octagon performances lead us to believe that he's gotten worse and he had to step away from competition for military service and then again for injuries so what version of Du Ho Choi are we going to see this time now on the other side we have Kyle Nelson who only has five minutes to work Kyle Nelson would have a much better record if fights were only five minutes long he'd be a beast but that ain't how life works is it now I will say that he has had to bounce around weight classes he's had some tough matches matchups he's had to get called on short notice multiple times but what we see from him is after that first round he's a shell of himself and it only gets worse from there he's coming off a loss to Jai Herbert but it's a decision loss and I think that's a moral victory given the circumstances
performances. Jai Herbert, as we know, is a banger. He dropped Trinaldo, comma worthy, Ilya Tuporia. So going the distance there gives me some confidence in him that maybe he's going to be able to take some of that power from Duho Choi. And technique wise, I do expect Kyle Nelson to land a lot of leg kicks, land heavy hooks, because Choi is not defensively sound and his timing might be off from being out of competition for so long. I wish that Kyle Nelson went out there and tried to grapple. He's coming back down to 145. He should come into this fight in better shape than he has in the past. He's physically a lot stronger in this matchup. And if he wanted to, I think he could find a submission, but I don't know if he's going to go to that grappling because he has that suspect gas tank. So again, tough fight for me to call personally. I know a lot of people are going to be on Choi given that he's the favorite, but I don't want to bet the guy that hasn't won a fight in seven years. That's crazy to me. So I am going to take Kyle Nelson in this spot. I think if you took Kyle Nelson inside the distance, that makes sense. You probably get good odds on that in most of your sports books. And that's where I land this week. Give me Kyle Nelson to spoil the return of Superboy Duho Choi, who I like very much, but again, not somebody I could trust with the long layoff. Next, we're looking at a fight with Yusaka Kinoshita. He's fighting Adam Fugit this week. But before we get into this, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, comment something for the algorithm. You know how the algorithm works. Now for Adam Fugit, he's had two tough outs to start his UFC career. Last time out, he gets Michael Morales on short notice, nine days notice, and he was the biggest underdog on the card, but God damn it, he gave Michael Morales a fight. He landed some good shots, was able to win the first round, secure a takedown, and showed a lot of toughness, but we also need to acknowledge that when we're talking about a fighter's toughness, it's because they're getting touched up. Now he's matched up against fast rising Japanese star Kinoshita this week, who's been finishing everyone in his path and is coming off a slick slip and rip knockout on Dana White's contender series. And Kenosha looked very composed in the octagon despite his limited experience and only being 22 years old, but I will have to say that's not a huge surprise. He was fighting a guy who was 20 years old with five professional fights and no recorded amateur experience. Adam Fugit is quite the opposite. Adam Fugit is a vet. He doesn't have a ton of tread on his tires despite being a little bit older, but he has fought better competition, higher level competition, and in tougher circumstances. I do think that the best spot for this fight is that it doesn't go the distance because I think Kinoshita probably knocks Fugit out in the first or second round. But if that doesn't happen, I think Adam Fugit's going to be able to take over. Now, Fugit is a Muay Thai guy and that comes with a very square stance. It comes with getting hit often. Kinoshita's throwing hammers and if he finds the mark, he's going to knock Fugit out. But on the flip side, full camp Fugit might get into a rhythm and he might be able to extend this kid beyond halfway through the second round and I could see him having success late. Fugit is going to look to grapple here. I believe most people will try to grapple Kinoshita, so there is a path for him to have success. Taking the under two and a half rounds makes the most sense for me, but if you want to pick for this fight, it's probably the Japanese kid, it's probably Kinoshita to win, and it's probably by knockout. I like Adam Fugit, he's got dog in him, but he's so damn slow on the feet. That's something that I just couldn't get over. That's something that when you watch his other fights back, you notice. That's something that you notice when he was fighting Michael Morales. He's just too slow. But at his age, I don't expect him to be moving any faster. I think Kinoshita lands one of those left hands on him, puts him out, probably again first or second round. Next, we have a fight with Anshul Jubilee and Jekka Saragi, and the odds for this fight have him at nearly a pick em. And let me tell you something. Tell you something. Let me tell you something. All right. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Tell you something. I think this is free money for the brothers because Jubilee, while undefeated, technically sound, pretty athletic, is just not dangerous. He doesn't have much power. The jujitsu isn't anything that jumps off the page, and I think he's in real trouble here. And he's in trouble because because Jekka Saragi has real power, real pop in his hands, and he's willing to take one to give one, he bangs in the pocket. And he's got way more experience at the professional level, better experience than Jubilee as well. He has more finishes as a pro than Jubilee has professional fights. I could see Saragi winning this fight in the first round by either submission or knockout, really, because Jubilee likes to shoot for takedowns. Once he gets a taste of Saragi's power, I don't think he's gonna wanna spend any more time on the feet. And when he's looking for these takedowns, I think the shorter, stronger, man is going to be able to sprawl, circle to his back, and find a submission. And that is if, and only if, he doesn't knock this guy out before he gets a chance for that to happen. And maybe I'm missing something here. If you think I am, please let me know in the comments. But based on what I've seen from both of these guys, I don't see a situation where Anshul Jubilee wins this fight. I was shocked by the price. I saw these guys were matched up and went back and watched some of their fights, and I was just thinking like, oh, then Saragi guy is going to be minus 200. Nope, not the case. And in my opinion, probably one of the best betting 
exciting spots on the card and one that I will definitely be playing this week. Give me Jekka Saragi inside the distance. If you want the best possible odds on him, you can visit Betstamp. Betstamp is a free to use, free to download app that you can get right in the app store or the play store. What they do is look at the best possible odds on the major domestic regulated sports books that are available to you wherever you live and they bump the best odds to the top. So you might have better odds at BetMGM than you would with DraftKings, better odds at FanDuel than you would with Caesar Sportsbook, things like that. It also helps you track your bets and if you want you can sit through a setup session where they help you set up accounts with these new sports books and they fund the account for you free money for you to go to play with and you guys probably know how sports books or fantasy apps or any of that works by now they give you free money if you win your bet with the free money you get to keep that money that's how it works if you're interested in attending a quick setup session you can let me know in the comments or you can send me a direct message on twitter at kunith mma let me know that you're interested in the setup session we'll talk i'll explain how it works and then you can get your free money and start to be able to get the best possible odds on your mma bets your nfl bets your nba bets really whatever you're looking for next we're looking at a fight with jiang li and yi Zha. i'm very confident one of my most confident picks on the card is going to be Lee in this matchup. Lee is one of my most confident picks on the card because he looked better on the road to UFC in his fights, but also because of the level of competition Yi Zha has fought. Yi Zha is one of these guys who's coming over from WLF wars. He fought a lot on the Chinese regional scene, and we see time and time again fighters that are fighting on that regional scene come to the UFC and just have nothing to offer. And you look at his record and think, well, maybe he's going to be able to have some kind of grappling advantage. He's obviously looking to wrestle if you watch any tape, but also you look at the record and see all these submissions and you see all these finishes. But again, WLF War is very low level stuff. Think of Na Liang. Na Liang comes to the UFC with this huge list of all these finishes, a lot of them being submissions because submissions are probably the easier way to beat low level competition. And then she comes to the UFC and she really doesn't have much to offer. There are multiple examples of this, but I don't think that this guy is going to make very much noise in the UFC. I think that Lee is going to pack him up and probably knocks him out in the first or second round. For Yija, his path to victory would be to wrestle here but even then i don't think he's going to be able to get this fight to the ground effectively get it where it needs to be for him to be able to win i think ji young lee has more skills and more tools to win this fight so give me lee to win and i'm going to say it's inside the distance I know we don't talk much about DraftKings on this video, that's more for the final picks video later in the week, but one of my favorite plays on DraftKings as well. Next we have a fight with Rinya Nakamura, he's fighting Toshiomi Kazama this week. Nakamura is a huge favor and it's for good reason. This guy has exactly what you would want in a situation like this. Strong wrestling, like Olympic caliber wrestling and tight crisp boxing. On the other side you have a dangerous guy in Kazama who's winning a lot of fights and submitting a lot of people, his grappling is slick. This guy is some Somebody who can legitimately grapple but when you have a dominant wrestler against a guy who's looking for submissions it normally works out in the wrestler's favor and that's the issue with a lot of these jujitsu guys is that they are comfortable accepting bottom position because they feel like they still have a chance to win fights which they do that's what jujitsu is all about but i assure you a guy with a wrestling background like nakamura would prefer to be on top in a dominant position and i think he finds himself there early i think he finds himself there often if this fight does stay standing i think he has the slight striking advantage too again with that crisp boxing and the threat of the takedown opening up his striking as well but i do think that the most likely outcome here is that nakamura is able to secure takedowns land ground and pound stay busy and win rounds that way i don't think that kazama gets finished here and i do think that he's going to threaten for submissions which is going to stall positions from time to time but ultimately i see nakamura winning this fight it's going to be by decision i think the over in this fight makes a ton of sense give me rinya nakamura next we're looking at a fight with Young Sung Park and Sung Guk Choi. And Park is the rightful favorite here. He's a more dangerous fighter overall. And what I like that I see out of him is strong back control. When he gets on the back, he's got heavy hips, good control, opportunistic submission games. I love all that. When you watch him fight, you're not going to see a whole lot of wasted movement. He's very economical. And at first, when I was watching him, I thought that he was just flat footed, but I believe that's with intention. You see him walking guys down, cutting off the cage, very deliberate movement. Even in the clinch, it looks like the decisions that he makes are very mad measured and again deliberate. On the other side, Choi has not looked impressive in his road to UFC fights, at least not as impressive, and he goes the distance in most of his fights, and I think that lack of fight ending ability is really what's going to cost him here against a dangerous guy like Park. What I think happens here is Park is going to get the better of him in the striking exchanges, they're going to clinch up, he's going to find his way to the back, drag Choi down to the mat, and he's going to lock up a rear naked choke once he has back control. So give me Park
work in this fight by submission. Next, we have a fight with Ji Yun Kim. She's fighting Mandy Bohm this week. This is some high level women's MMA, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Nah, this is pretty low level, but I want to tell you to take the over in your parlays and move on, but we can't. We need to talk about who's going to win. Mandy Bohm is no good. She came into the UFC 7-0, a champion in other promotions, but as we talk about in the MMA space, level of competition, not there. And I know that's not everybody's favorite subject, but it is important because on her way to the UFC, she crushed more cans than a redemption center, but when she got to the UFC, we got bupkis. She made Ariane Lipsky look good. She followed that up with a loss to Victoria Leonardo. And on the other side, you have Jian Kim, who hasn't looked good, but she has fought stiffer competition. Most recently, she loses back-to-back -back fights that were really close against Jocelyn Edwards and Priscilla Cachoeira, who would both destroy Mandy Bohm. Before that, she loses to Molly McCann. No shame in that, really. She loses to Alexa Grasso, who's currently scheduled to fight Big Valentina for the title. So tough schedule overall for Fire Fist, and now she gets Mandy Bohm. What Kim does have going for her in this fight is her crazy volume, landing nearly six significant strikes per minute. And when you couple that with Mandy Bohm's incredibly poor negative striking differential, we have a treat on our hands for Ji Young Kim. I'm taking her to win this week, and I think a decision line is an absolute steal here, considering that Mandy Bohm is going to be tough enough to eat her shots. And a lot of that has to do with Mandy Bohm's toughness, which I'll give her that. Plus, I've seen non-nicotine vape pens hit harder than Ji Young Kim. So the pick for me is going to be Fire Fist. It's going to be decision, take the over, parlay that, do, do what you need to do. The over, it's there, it's a lock easy. Next we have Jung Young Park. He's fighting Dennis Tallulah this week. This looks like a good spot for Jung Young Park because he's a grinder who's going to lean on his grappling this week against the big puncher in Tallulah, just like he did last time out against Joseph Holmes. And you gotta love the style of fight that Jung Young Park brings to the table. Like if Iron Turtle was footwear, he'd be a pair of work boots. I expect him to close distance quickly, take Dennis Tallulah down, ride out the position. I don't see him looking for a ton of submissions if they aren't there, but he will take it if it's given. But I don't see see situations where he's hunting for a submission, like where he's in half guard or side control and starts to look for an arm triangle. I don't think that's going to happen. He's not really going to press the issue, but he will maintain a dominant position, stay busy with strikes and win rounds that way. Dennis Tolulin, on the other hand, is going to do everything he can to keep this fight on the feet because he does have dynamite in his hands. We saw that last time out against Jamie Pickett when he put him away in the second round. He really turned up the pressure, got the knockout, and he has that fight changing power and willingness to go balls to the wall to get his opponent and out of there, but that's a tough ask this week against a guy with solid cardio, durability, and a big advantage on the mat. So Iron Turtle should win this fight. I see him grinding out a decision win. Expect takedowns in each round, solid top control. Give me Jung Young Park this week by decision. And we'll finish up with super prospect Tatsuru Tayara. He's fighting Jesus Aguilar this week. The line for this fight is crazy wide, too wide to bet on, too wide to put into your parlays, but I do think that Tatsuru Tayara is the real deal. He's undefeated, big for the weight class, a grappling whiz, and he's got a lot of experience not only as a pro, but as an amateur as well. That's huge. He showed well-roundedness in his debut when he dropped Carlos Candelario, took him down, reversed positions when he was on bottom, and he won every round. He followed that up with a dominant performance against CJ Vergara when he was able to get takedowns, lots of control time, and then found an armbar from the back. Now he's welcoming Jesus Aguilar to the UFC, and Aguilar's record is made up almost entirely of guillotine chokes, and that's going to be his undoing this week. Guillotines rarely work at the highest level of MMA. I was actually considering making a video of just failed guillotine, unsuccessful guillotine attempts. If you were able to put together a compilation of failed guillotine attempts in the UFC, that video would bang. It'd do numbers, and I don't feel like doing it, but there's a video idea out there for you, so if you're ambitious, go go for it. But anyway, when he tries to do that this week against Tatsuru, he's going to end up on his back, Tyara's going to escape, and he's going to be all over him. Now, Aguilar is relentless with these attempts. He's going to be looking for him. That's basically the only thing he's looking for, so if you put, say, a quarter of a unit on Aguilar by submission at those wild odds, I'm not mad at you, but I do think that the most likely outcome here is that Tatsuru ends up winning by submission here. I think that that makes the most sense, and I think it probably happens in the second round. Give me Tatsuru Tayara this week by submission. If you've made it to this point in the video, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, comment something for the algorithm, and I'll see you later in the week for the final picks.